to another edition of Give Us Back Our Country. We want to empower you, the people, between elections with the tools of direct democracy. That is where you can have a direct say in public policy in a way that you currently can't. Why are we signing a blank check every three or four years to the politicians who are so out of step with the expectations of the people? And again, we're joined by some special guests today, David. That's, you're so right, Jai. And we have today Pauline Hanson, the celebrated and courageous <laughs> politician. Welcome, Pauline. Thank you, David. And Peter Manuel, whose flag Australia is in the forefront of defending the rights of farmers to maintain Australia as the food bowl of the world. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Expenditure on Commonwealth, state and local government programs for Aborigines is $25 billion a year. Is that not recognition enough? That's what former Labour Party Minister Gary Johns recently asked when he was writing a piece in The Australian. And he continued, Aborigines were recognised, after a fashion, and certainly with practical effect, in the Constitution. Is that not recognition enough? Aborigines are recognised in favourable ways in the Family Law Act, in Adoption Acts, in Coroner's Acts, in Sentencing and the Charities Act, and in a plethora of Land Rights and Heritage Acts. Are these all not recognition enough, he says. He says that many regard the chances for recognition as viable, this is in the Constitution, only in a minimalist form. Well, there is a proposal, as we know, that the Indigenous people be recognised in the Australian Constitution. And what Gary John says, only if this is minimal, he's not saying this with any hostility, but with warm regard for the Aboriginal people. But what people are concerned about is the danger that activist judges will re use this to take more power as they have done in the past. That is, legislative rather than judicial power. Well, it certainly seems that uh, most people don't see a need for this. It seems that although there's sort of vague talk around it and without any detail whatsoever being on the table, it's hard to envisage some form of words in a proposal that people would find acceptable that would satisfy those conditions that, that you've correctly identified and that Gary Johns has identified. So how much impetus actually is there to, to this debate? Well, what I understand is John Howard wanted to put in, when there was a referendum, on whether we become a republic to acknowledge the Aboriginal people as the traditional owners of the land in a preamble. Now, to explain to people, and please correct me, David, at any time here to do with the Constitution. The Constitution, to me, is basically the Bible. All our laws and running of Parliament and the guidelines of our politicians in legislation is the, the basis of our Constitution. Now, that Constitution, if, if the government makes any laws, that is outside the rights of the Australian people based on the Constitution. That can be challenged in a High Court. So that's how important our Constitution is. Mm. Now, my belief is if you accept and acknowledge the Aboriginal people in a preamble, even on the Constitution, as the traditional owners of the land, then I beg to ask the question, if we ever become a republic and sever our ties with the crown and sovereignty to the land, will the land then revert back to native title? If this is then challenged in the High Court, and Australians have already said, yes, we acknowledge them as the traditional owners of the land, where does it leave every Australian as far as the ownership of their land. Are they going to then ask for compensation? Is it then still freehold sovereign land or does it revert back to native title? Now this was asked of Nick Minchin. Mm -hmm. And Nick Minchin said it is, it could open up a can of worms. So that's what I said people. I will not be signing yes to a preamble acknowledging the ownership, uh, pre, um, the traditional owners 
of the land to the Aboriginal people. And I don't trust our politicians. I don't trust um, what judgment the High Court could put down. I believe that we would leave ourselves wide open and I don't think it's necessary. Well, well they're very legitimate concerns. And of course, the other thing which David often points out is that a preamble speaks from the time the document was written and encapsulates all of the uh, context at that time. So for us to go back and somehow change uh, that seems a very strange thing to do. Yes, can you imagine the Americans going and writing a preamble today for the Constitution or the Declaration mm. of Independence or, or, or the British writing one for Magna Carta? Mm. They, you'd be laughed out of the place. The problem is that the Constitution is what the High Court says it is. How and they interpret the Constitution. Yes, really it and, is, and isn't it? which they did, for example, Mm. When John Howard tried to make, I think, the reasonable change in the election act, electoral act, that the rolls would close on the date that the election was called. And the reason was because in between the calling of the election and the closing of the rolls, when you had about a week in between, the electoral commission was flooded. There was a tsunami of registrations which they couldn't check. Mm -hmm. and which later would be found quite often to be completely fraudulent. And if you haven't bothered to enrol, yes. why should you? Yes. The High Court said the Constitution doesn't allow that. Now, you could tip that Constitution upside down, read it back to yeah. front. You can't find a provision saying that the, that the Constitution says that the electoral rolls must be, must be kept open for another week. The High Court said that. They can say what they want whenever they interpret the Constitution. The, under the traditional doctrine of legal interpretation, preambles are supposed to have no effect in interpretation. But so was international treaties. We were told that international treaties, we taught this at law school, international treaties can have no effect on the internal law of Australia until they are adopted by an act of parliament. But in a case rela re relating to uh, the husband, no, the, a man who was a drug importer, he argued that he couldn't be deported because because of the Family Law Act and some he provisions. The rights of the child, the rights he of the child, the child and he fathered a child in Australia and yes, he wanted so to. He TO. Had, yes, TO cases, TO. as you know. And, and both sides of Parliament were outraged by this interpretation by the High Court, contrary to everything we had learnt in law school, that no international treaty can have any effect in Australia until it's adopted still, by the Parliament. I think that still stands today. TO, I mean, yes. they, they, can they can challenge it in the court yes, under the, the rights of the child to actually stay in Australia. You're so right. Uh, the Keating government announced that it would reverse that decision of the High Court by legislation. When the Howard government got in and introduced legislation to reverse it, the Labour opposition in the Senate blocked it. They wouldn't allow it. Mm. So it's still there, it's still there, uh, that case, Tia, is still there. It still I effectively says that uh, in interpreting uh, I Australian think it was law. used even more recently than that as well. I did make mention of that in, in a statement in Parliament mm. about the Tio case. And I think it has been used more, most recently about a, um, a migrant to Australia who created criminal act and used that same case, father, child in Australia. Mm. And uh, the immigration minister could not deport couldn't vote them. Just because of malicious people, and I'm sorry, people. No, 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 go for it. We'll say that uh, I'm anti-Aboriginal, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I worked with, when, when it was purely voluntary, I worked with Hal Wooten, a judge in New South Wales, who established the Aboriginal Legal Service before it became a government entity. And the reason was because I knew that Aborigines were being picked up by the police at night only because they were Aborigines, not because they'd committed a crime. Mm -hmm. They were targets, and I thought that was wrong and we mm -hmm. should do something mm -hmm. about it. Well, I think you mentioned in your book uh, that you and Jai wrote, uh, we need integration, not segregation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very, very true. And I agree with Pauline. I don't trust the politicians. And all due respects to yourself, David, uh, I don't trust a lot of lawyers. So it's a situation where that's a very, very uh, touchy case. But what amazes me is that, uh, and I've mixed with a lot of Aboriginal people, and uh, so is my wife coming from up around Tipperborough the most isolated place in New South Wales, back at Burke. And um, why haven't we got more Aboriginals in our hospitals as nurses, in our police force, in our army? You know, we've got a lot of Indian workers and, and Chinese and nothing against them. I've got a lot of respect for the Chinese and good workers. But it, it amazes me 
we just can't keep throwing money. There's got to be a solution, and the solution is these people have got to build self-esteem. And the only way they're going to build self-esteem is let's give them a fair go like everybody else. Get them off the welfare. Exactly. Um, you know the old saying, if you, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Mm. But if you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Exactly. And that has been the problem. I, I believe that politicians over the years have used the Aboriginal issue as a political football to win votes in Parliament. And I don't think they've done enough to help the Aboriginal people. I'm not against Aboriginals. I believe that we should all share this land together. No one owns land any more than anyone else. And it's, it, people say, well, they were the first inhabitants here before we came. But I always go back to the point is, why would an Aboriginal have more right to the land than I do? I was born here. Cool. I don't know of any other country that I can call home, mm. that I feel part of, that I feel passionate enough to fight for. And that's where I think it's unity of working together and, and embrace this country and unite as Australians. I get annoyed when people call themselves Aboriginal Australians or English Australians or Pakistani Australians or whatever Australians. Um, we are Australians. Mm. And stop the segregation. I tried to do and uh, help um, and represent the Aboriginal people when I was in Parliament, but it wasn't portrayed that way. Mm. I tried to stand up and represent them and the health issue and the educational issue, but the ministers found to further themselves and to denigrate me was to say that I s overstepped protocol. I never did. I will stand up and fight for anyone that I believe needs my help. Well, we have to get rid of the, the, this romantic idea that they're somehow living how they were in these regional areas, okay. which is it's a joke. It's, it's about finding a way that you can, as exactly as you say, see that there's one common goal, one common purpose, and, and to live together. You know what you, know what you do? Way. You treat everyone the same. Correct. It doesn't Correct. matter about your cultural background, mm. what colour your skin is, who you are. If you are in need of financial or health assistance, you get it. Mm. If you are an Aboriginal living in the cities and your children are going to the same schools as any other child, you don't get educational benefits, you don't get your, your lunches paid for or mm. breakfast is given to you, and you don't get your tours and, and ventures all paid for because that kid sitting right next to the Aboriginal kid, their family's struggling just as much. Mm. Mm. And until we bring equality, and that's what I have always called for, equality, help those on an individual's needs basis. That is the only time we will unite and pull together as one. But the segregation of who you are and make it known, these politicians do it, 25 billion a year, what a waste of money. And I see these elaborate houses built the housing companies make a fortune out of it. Aboriginals are put in there, destroy the whole place, burn it down, come back in and repair it again. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, and I know what I'm talking about, I went out to Palm Island and I was walking around the houses and I had a complete, oh, what a mess, falling down around the ears. And I had these two, uh, these three Aboriginal men behind me. One was younger, was about 15. They came up and said, Pauline, we want to work. Mm. Now, Palm Island had $3 million a year go through their canteen, let alone what they brought back from towns for themselves on the barges. That's how much alcohol they went through. This is 2.30 in the afternoon. These three and the 15-year-old were drunk. He said, we want to work. I said to them, and I said to Charlie Perkins, why don't you start teaching them and training them to actually do the repairs and learn the trade to fix up their own homes and take pride in their communities? Charlie Perkins said to me, he said, you don't understand. He said, you don't understand our connection with the land. And I said, well, if you have that much of a connection, why don't you clean up your rubbish? Mm, fair <laughs> comment. These are not difficult issues. They're difficult in one respect, that the policies that we're seeing coming from the political class are out of step with the expectations of the people. But there is a common sense solution to this and we want you to put your voice to these issues. We encourage you to join the debate. Join the debate on Twitter using the hashtag Gubboc, G-U-B-O-C, and also contact us directly using our Twitter handles. Pauline is on Twitter. Her details will be below. Jai Matinkovitz and at Prof David Flint. Have your say. Until next time, this is Give Us Back Our Country. I'm Jai Matinkovitz.
Australia is one of the world's oldest continuing democracies, yet our institutions of representative democracy have been compromised. They've been compromised by the power brokers, the faceless men in the major political parties. Many of our politicians today seem to be lacking the basic common sense, good judgment and decency of the average Australian. The agenda they're applying with the inner city elites would just not pass the pub test. Yeah, obviously everyone's got their vote and they have their little bit of a say, but in the end of the day, the politicians do what they want, not really what we want. I'm basically held accountable in my position. However, the politicians are not held accountable between elections. So they might come out and say one thing at the start of their campaign, and then as they become elected, they do the completely opposite. Yeah, they're not thinking in the people, they think in themselves and the pocket. We don't <laughs> think much of them, to be honest. Uh, I think they just say what people really want them to hear. It's unfair. Yeah, when the politicians say something, I don't always believe it. I think uh, the, they do no justice to our vote. We vote for them, we honestly believe what they're going to say. If they don't fulfil it, then we hopefully get rid of them next time. If they should make a promise, they should keep it. Uh, I guess it's not very fair on the people who they promise, make the promises to, I guess. I, um, I don't know how you'd change it to make it any better, but I'm sure there's a better way. They should be kicked out. Increasingly, Australians are demanding that our politicians be truly accountable not just every three or four years in blank check elections. Truly accountable, as nurses, doctors and journalists are, accountable on every day of every week, of every month and of every year, just as you are.